But with no further ado, I want to introduce our first presenter, John Kreitz, the CEO of Rocky Mountain Institute RMI. In addition to just being a generally cool guy, John is an internationally recognized leader on global energy issues and climate change. Joining the organization in 2012, John has managed the strategy and execution of RMI's global research and collaboration activities in multiple senior positions at the organization, most recently serving as Chief Program and Strategy Officer. Under his leadership, RMI has advanced market-based solutions to transform the global energy system to secure a clean, prosperous, and zero carbon future for all. So with that, John, thank you so much for being here today. And I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Sarah. It's such a joy to be here. Thanks to you and Green Builder Media for, for 19 years, uh, 19 years uh, of really leading the industry and helping uh, share that vision um, for, for positivity and hope. And I, we're gonna talk a little bit about positivity and hope. and specifically the tipping points that exist in the market that we all should be aware of, that when we, they add up, lead to a different vision for what's possible and how quickly we're getting there. Um, first off, let me just talk a little bit about my institution, RMI. We're an independent nonprofit organization of experts who work across disciplines to accelerate the clean energy transition and improve lives. We've been around about 40 years now. Um, we're passionately nonpartisan and non ideological. And as a non government organization, we have a mandate to promote the public interest and the public good. So, in doing that, we work for individuals, corporations, communities, and foundations, and government leaders around the world, and always are trying to create that clean energy future for all. And that for all is hugely important to us. It means that we're advocating for a just energy transition one that repairs the harms of the fossil fuel economy and equitably distributes the benefits of clean energy so that no one's left behind, especially the frontline communities who bear a disproportionate burden of the climate crisis while being denied economic benefits. So as far as our North Star, you know, all strategy starts with a goal. Ours is clear and it hasn't changed. We need to act quickly to avoid the climate catastrophe and in order to do so, we must cut emissions in half by 2030. And energy production and use, specifically the burning of coal, gas, and oil to power industries, buildings, and transportation, together those account for 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's why energy is our North Star. We know that energy is at the heart of the climate problem, but it's also, it's also the key to the solution. So with that very brief introduction to RMI, I'm gonna now talk through some of our team's latest insights on the energy transition, and then we'll open it up to question and answer at the end. But first, I wanted to share a few stories from my travels around the past year. I've been CEO for just over a year now, and really show you some of the work that our team is doing across the globe that gives us cause for hope. And I'm gonna start by taking us first to Nigeria where on a trip there last spring, I had the chance to meet the king of Mokoloki town, situated on the edge of the grid, right outside of Lagos, right? Um, and four years ago, RMI worked with a, a local private developer, Niotropical Technologies Limited, to install a 185 kilowatt solar mini grid with battery storage. So think about that as something, you know, roughly the size of what you would see uh, on your local uh, public library, for instance. We did that in collaboration with the local electric distribution company in Mokoloki town, and they did it for profit, right? They did it because there was a, an economic opportunity. The installation of that mini grid in the town of 200 went, transformed life, lives there, and the town went from having at most three hours of power every day to being able to keep lights on through the night. Suddenly kids were reading and studying past sunset, storefronts stayed open, and other work could go into the evening. The mini grid also was used to power water purification, the bakery and a hotel, right? And so it changed the, the whole outlook for the community. When I was there though, just last year, there were some issues and I didn't realize it, but I was gonna be put on the spot, right? Um, and the king you know, told me how two ice boxes in the local convenience store had suddenly multiplied and become five ice boxes. 
that an entrepreneurial arc welder had set up shop in town in order to repair farm equipment, that there were also 17 new air conditioners in town, and that, in fact, the town size had doubled from 200 to 400 people in just over uh, two years, right? And so they wanted to understand what they could do and why it was they were short of power. And we had to talk through that, although the sun offers unlimited free power, the grid has to be expanded in order to support all the new energy. And so we made a plan to expand the size of the grid and indeed help that community continue in its economic growth. Now I wanna shift from that very localized implementation to kind of thinking at scale, where I, last summer I had the chance to go to China and I visited the town of Zhangjiakou uh, north of Beijing, which was the site of the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. And there RMI convened a group of global experts from Europe, from Australia, from the US, from China, to share best practices on how to run a high penetration renewable grid. Now, Zhangjiakou is, a, it's in some respects, an unremarkable city, right? It's about 2 million people but it is remarkable for the fact that it runs on 100% renewable power. And it has clear skies and clean skies in the process. So here you're looking out from the top of the local grids op grid operations center. And what you're seeing is solar and wind being, you know, kind of across the horizon as a proving ground for the rest of the country. They developed some of the most sophisticated transmission technology to allow for load balancing between regions here. And the interesting thing is China is taking this learning lab as a model for other areas of the country and is expanding it rapidly. So we've gone from kind of mini grid implications and applications for local communities to macro grid capabilities that are starting to help us not just envision, but prove out the possibility of a highly electrified, high penetration renewable grid. So let's let's go back to buildings, which of course uh, Green Build is uh, Green Builder Media has been right in the middle of. And I want to talk about uh, a location here in the United States where last uh, last fall, actually uh, on November first, I was visiting Salem, Massachusetts. And Salem, Massachusetts, on November first is uh, after Halloween, so it's kind of uh, I was. Uh, post uh, post cleanup on the North Pole after Christmas, you could kind of imagine. Um, and I was there specifically to showcase a new innovation with the state local energy office, with local contractors, with donors and public officials that were all on site to see the future of net zero construction. And what RMI had done there in partnerships with all of these entities was to showcase how you could industrialize retrofit technology and create dramatically reduced energy consumption through the use and applications of fully integrated panels that could snap onto the side of the building, right? Um, so what you're seeing here is a picture of exactly the different mechanical packages that are uh, uh, attached to the building that include integrated heating and cooling. They include upgraded water and solar. They have uh, super insulation and we're attaching that to the side of the building quite rapidly. There was, it only took about 10 minutes to snap a panel on. Um, and importantly, this retrofit is being done without moving any of the tenants out, right? The final connections involve about four hours in each apartment in order to do so, but you can, essentially industrialize the, the retrofit of large scale multifamily, low income housing and beyond, and do that in a way that meets people where they are, that, that supports grandma and grandpa and doesn't uh, force them out of their apartment. And in the process, saves over 80% of their energy bills, which is a pure, you know, if you're in a low income housing project, that's a huge uh, benefit that we're establishing uh, in the process of also achieving climate goals. So, you know, from the learnings in this project, we're expanding the supply chain, uh, we're building out the capacity in the market in Boston, and we're looking at ways to expand across the country. And it's very easy to see how over just even the next year, we'll be able to take a, a site like this and go from within six months from planning all the way through execution, 
get a deep energy retrofit executed. So that's, that's the retrofit challenge. I want to rotate to one more place with you all and shift back to Asia and go to India, where uh, RMI has been working with the largest developer here over the last four years, conceptualizing what an affordable net zero community looks like in India. This, this is a picture of Palava City, um, which is a net zero community being built for uh, 1 million people with passive cooling, with integrated green space, built to be monsoon resilient, not just for today, but for 2050, right? It's a project that's being developed by Indians, for Indians, using the local labor pool at India costs for low and middle income Indians. Now, this is a new build construction and already 160,000 inhabitants have moved in, right? They've got three phases of construction that's complete. What it's most you know, interesting for is it's an example of learning by doing, that in each phase, they've instrumented the buildings to understand the thermal footprint, the capacity of the building. They've surveyed all of the tenants to understand what's working and what's not, what they'd prefer. And so each different development phase represents a giant leap forward in construction technology from choices of paints to how they use natural drafting uh, within the buildings in order to create uh, comfort without cost. So these are real ways that we can see, you know, kind of the, the world tackling, not just the challenges of the energy transition, but also dealing with issues like lethal heat that are going to be much more prevalent in the global South and countries like India that are exposed to the worst consequences of climate change. And that, that all is cause for hope. So I've given you four vignettes, small and large, right, that are real signs of success and progress. And I'm, I started there because I wanted to give you stories that we can all latch on to and understand. The fact is the prevailing narrative that you're all familiar with is that we're off track, right? We're off track when it comes to climate. And I will say that's true, but there's more to the story. On one hand, we are seeing disastrous climate impacts and suffering devastating losses around the world disproportionately, mind you, by those who can least afford it. But also, new evidence is emerging that the planet's average annual temperature rise is already one and a half degrees Celsius for the first time last year. We've hit that threshold. So yes, we're deep in the climate emergency and every tenth of a degree matters. But at the same time, and this is the important point, right? At the same time, we know what the solutions are and we're seeing exponential growth in these clean energy technologies, driven primarily by markets and economics, by innovation and competition. Competition, right? We're reaching these positive tipping points much faster than expected. And we need to recognize that because the headlines give much more attention to doom and gloom, right? As my four examples demonstrate, this transition, it's creating a better world in the process with cleaner air, with more employment, with resilience, with community, right, as all delivered as primary benefits. So I, I know I've said a lot there. Let me give you some of the grounding facts when we actually roll up the numbers and see what exactly is happening. Because we're in a moment where exponential growth is possible and it's actually well underway. In the power sector, for instance, solar and wind are now the cheapest form of new energy for 85% of people on the planet. When we look at cars, just a few years ago in 2020, one in 20 cars sold globally was an EV. Last year, it was one in five cars. We're seeing exponential growth in batteries, you know, kind of which sit certainly within cars, but are also a critical enabler for the transition across the grid. And this is being driven by a combination of rising energy density or quality at the same time that we're seeing falling costs as we bring each of these industries to scale. And we're in the early stages of similar trends in heat pumps, in hydrogen, and other critical solutions. So let's dive into each of these in a bit more detail. 
Growth in renewables has been driven primarily by rapid cost declines. Over the past decade, we've seen a 60% reduction in onshore wind costs, 70% in offshore wind, and 76% in solar. This means renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels today. And importantly, not just cheaper than new fossil fuels, but cheaper than existing fossil fuel plants in many cases, right? In many places around the world, it's actually cheaper to install new solar and wind than it is to pay for just the fuel to operate a fossil plant. When this happens, we call it shutdown economics, and it's the reason we see coal plants being rapidly decommissioned around the world. We actually expect the cost for solar and wind to continue falling by another 25 to 50 percent by the end of this decade. And the IEA now estimates that we'll install as much renewable capacity over the next five years as the fossil fuel system has installed in the last 120. It's become clear that fossil fuel demand has peaked for electricity, right? The world is rapidly responding to these improving economics, and the Global South is no exception. There too, cheap, clean power can fuel an economic boom in remote villages like Mokoloki Town, but also in major metropolises like Ho Chi Minh City. That's because this exponential growth is happening globally and in diverse parts of the world, as you can see in the examples here. Countries in the global south have the opportunity to avoid the sunk costs, the physical risks, and the pollution from fossil fuel-based systems and to quickly deploy renewable technologies. They're less hampered by legacy infrastructure, and they can immediately and locally distribute the benefits of clean energy. Keep in mind that countries in Africa, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia can be energy superpowers in the next energy economy. And as cheap renewable power pushes in, electrification will deliver even more benefits. For example, with EVs, which are rapidly growing in market share today, seemingly in a chaotic pattern on the left here. But in fact, all these countries are following a very similar S-curve trend. They just started at different times. And change can be quick. Within a decade, new car sales can go from nothing to almost all new, new sales, as Norway has proven. You know, the, the rise of EVs does, it has consequences, and it means the end of the ice age or the internal combustion energy age. As EVs take over, we see that this happens quickly. In fact, internal combustion engine sales already peaked a few years ago and will likely continue their decline in the coming decade. As I mentioned, one in five cars sold last year was an EV. By 2026, it'll be one in two cars. And China is almost there today, by the way. In 2030, roughly three in four cars sold will be an EV based on our projections. And around 2040, there's going to be very little demand left for oil from internal combustion engine vehicles worldwide. That, that is exponential change. And this is driven by prices, by consumer demand, by policy, but also increasingly by car brands themselves reinventing themselves as fully electric. But the rise of the EV car isn't the only part of a larger story on the rise of batteries. Batteries themselves are on a meteoric rise in terms of market share, driven by ever-improving costs and quality. Over the past 30 years, lithium-ion battery costs have come down 99% thanks to the economy of, economies of scale and innovation, while energy density, which is really a key indicator of quality, has increased fivefold over the same time frame. In the 1990s, batteries really could only work in very small applications on power electronics where people could afford to pay for that high energy density. Then in the 2000s, smaller vehicles such as mopeds started to be converted and were unlocked than cars. And over the past five years, we've made amazing strides. Battery trucks are now rolling out and the first electric plane and ship models are on their way as well. This combination of falling cost and rising quality leads to increasing battery sales, which creates a virtuous cycle. The higher quality and lower cost batteries become, the more they sell, 
And the more that we sell, the more the economies of scale and learning effects improve the cost and quality. And that creates this virtuous cycle. That's been the driving engine of battery growth. Over the past 30 years, battery sales have increased 33% per year on average, but are getting even faster now and are closer to 40% over the last decade. And those are only just getting started. As battery technologies scale in one sector, economies of scale kick in and battery costs and quality further improve, which allows batteries to tip the next sector. The result is a domino effect of battery uptake. Electrified two and three wheelers and buses are already at more than 40% sales today. Cars are rapidly reaching that level as well and will be the biggest domino to fall. Light trucks and stationary storage are next in line. Heavy trucks will follow thereafter, and then we get to planes and ships as longer term prospects. To give you a sense of just how quickly the technology is developing, just two weeks ago, Cattle, which is the world's largest battery manufacturer, announced a new bus battery that has zero degradation over its first thousand charges. And as a result, they're offering a 15 year, 1 million mile, mile warranty for it, right? This is the level of technological innovation that's happening right now. And as batteries grow, they're going to push in EVs and enable renewables to surge up. The result is a rapid decline in fossil fuels. Now, I just mentioned cattle, which is a leading Chinese company. So let's look at the geopolitical implications of the energy transition for a moment. Technology revolutions happen once every 40, 40 or 50 years, right? They're led by a central country and they diffuse out from there. Chinese costs and deployment should be our frame of reference today. To compete for the industries of the future, the US and Europe have to solve barriers to change like grids and regulations. China dominates production across clean tech markets today but there's ample growth opportunity for the US and Europe to catch up. Barriers to change are thus really just barriers to geopolitical power. And this competition will open up more opportunity for the global South. Competition between the leading regions is stimulating more investment and innovation and will drive down the cost faster and further. That speeds up the technology transfer for the rest of the world and hastens access to that technology where fossil fuel demand starts to decline. But I also want to emphasize that cooperation has a key role to play because we're facing this common crisis of climate change. And just as on a sports field, competition requires cooperation to establishing the league rules. In the same way on climate technology, we need to, as a united country and planet, involve each other in standard setting and technology transfer and trade so that the competition itself flourishes. We've seen this kind of exponential change before. None of this, none of this is novel. This kind of disruption is well documented throughout history. During the Industrial Revolution, there was the rapid proliferation of railways, of train transport, the telegraph, and steam-powered ships. And more recently, of course, in the information revolution, we've watched the internet, smartphones, and social media take hold worldwide. And we're witnessing it now with solar, with electric vehicles, with batteries, and beyond. In each case, though, there have been skeptics and laggards. Even, even Henry Ford's lawyer told him that the automobile's a fad, but the horse is here to stay. But the superior technologies ultimately prevailed, the ones that were lower cost, the ones that met people with their immediate needs. The leaders of the next energy economy are yet to be determined. This time around, we can and must make sure, though, that we leave no one behind, that this transition is equitable, that it's inclusive and resilient. Ensuring that clean energy benefits developing and emerging economies is critical to meeting climate goals. We have a lot of work to do in unlocking capital investment and implementing solutions across the global south. And in the process, we have to respect the fundamental right of communities and countries to shape their own pathways and to build the next energy system
that meets them where they are and provides economic prosperity and security. You know, the interesting thing is we as humans underestimate the pace of technology adoption. Despite the clear evidence behind the current trends, past trends of exponential growth, we seem determined to keep underestimating the pace of change year after year and expect everything to happen incrementally and linearly. And that leads decision makers to underestimate year after year what's needed, which is a recipe for lost economic competitiveness. We're just not well equipped as a species to think exponentially versus linearly. So what we really need to do and what we're really talking about is shifting everyone's mindsets, learning from our past and channeling that into motivation and a new sense of possibility and opportunity. That's the critical narrative that needs spreading. You know, we build to what we project and if what we project isn't aligned in the end with what we need and what's economically the right way, we waste capital in the process. Now, when you look, and for the wonks out there, right, when we look at the fast and faster forecasts that are on this chart, we've used uh, some advanced statistics to really think through what those are. And we, those, the fast uh, represents the the difference between or the pace represents the difference between what in mathematics is called the Gompertz curve and the logistics curve. And when we back tested all of this data, like with the internet adoption, what we see is that the reality really tends to lie somewhere between these two scenarios. That's the world that we need to build to. This story of exponential growth in renewables is one of four key trends that will define the pace and scale of the energy transition in the coming decades. Efficiency, peak fossil, clean growth, and just transition. And we've really focused on clean growth so far, but I do want to call out efficiency in particular because it's such an important driver of pollution reduction historically, and it's going to remain so into the future. And when we actually put together efficiency and clean energy deployment, those two squeeze out future fossil demand, causing its use to peak and then decline, and, it, and help us slow down the, the potential overshoot against our one and a half degrees Celsius goal as a planet. Implementing this transition in a just and equitable way is essential, right? Um, and I do want to note that you know, a durable solution involves everyone. And fundamentally, if we don't all cross the finish line together to a net zero world in 2050, we all lose. So we're all vested in making this happen as well. But I do wanna turn back to energy efficiency. Energy efficiency has been a key driver in managing growth and emissions, but it's entirely underappreciated. Another way that we can think about efficiency is avoided energy. And for us at RMI, efficiency has been in our DNA ever since our founding 40 years ago. Amory uh, Lovins, our founder, coined the term, the megawatt. And we remain committed to highlighting and accelerating the capture of this immense potential because it's both the most affordable, but also the most durable way of tackling climate. And because in the process, it makes investments in clean energy that much more impactful. By now, you've probably heard the double down, triple up mantra that came out of COP28 in Dubai. The relative scale of the carbon benefits of each of these are similar, right? When we think about doubling energy efficiency and tripling the capacity of renewables. So they're roughly the same scale. But efficiency itself, especially when we do it first, again, has that multiplicative effect of increasing the impact overall of any invested renewable capacity. When we look at the arc of energy history, each unit of energy has consistently generated more and more GDP over the past 50 years. Since 1970, the productivity of each gigajoule or unit of energy that we put into the system has doubled, 
right? We've created more economic value for each unit of energy. That's enabled the world to get richer while losing less energy. We need to do the same thing with carbon now, right? Purchasing less energy costs money. So it only makes sense that over time, frugal engineers, businesses, and consumers will find clever ways to wring more value from fewer inputs. This simple observation is a key feature of energy history. From the beginning of the 19th century on, the average efficiency for a particular service has always improved. For, for example, right since 1900, the efficiency of home heating is up four times and the efficiency of lighting is up 50 fold. In the 1990s or 1970s, Amory Lovins showed that we'd see a large increase uh, in efficiency uh, that leads to a trend in energy productivity. And he's right. Today, RMI contests we're about to see another increase in energy productivity, thanks to the growth in clean tech, electrification, and the wider end use efficiency. In the same vein as 50 years ago, many industry experts don't see it coming. Now, before I wrap up, I wanna take a moment to share an initiative that RMI is launching to measure and reduce embodied carbon, or the, the carbon in the materials we use, while also advancing energy efficiency in the built environment. It's in partnership with Green Builder Media and it's called Home Builders Can. We're very solution oriented here at RMI and we like to walk the talk. As many of you know, emissions from materials for new homes in the US is equivalent to the total emissions from some countries. RMI's Carbon Free Buildings team has launched Home Builders Can to help home builders take the lead in understanding, measuring, reporting, and acting strategically to adopt and scale profitable, low embodied carbon building practices. I bring up this work in particular because energy efficiency, which I've just shared, is a major solution to the climate crisis that we haven't yet tapped to its fullest potential and embodied carbon. These two forces, they're not in opposition. There are solutions that address both, such as air tightness improvements. It's a win-win scenario where airtight construction is an effective strategy for both improved energy efficiency with relatively low embodied carbon impacts. We're delighted to partner up with Green Builder Media and many other partners and supporters in the building sector on this work. You can follow the QR code on the screen to learn more about Home Builders Can and join our efforts. So elevating ourselves back up to 30,000 feet, right? And taking a view of the energy transition from above. The combined impact of efficiency and the exponential growth in clean tech means that fossil fuels are gonna get squeezed out of the system over time. It's a changing of the guards in the energy system. The only question is, can this happen fast enough? Less efficient technologies can be outcompeted by a more efficient entrance on running cost. Both on the supply and demand side, new, more efficient technologies have emerged. The relative efficiency gain over fossil incumbents ranges from two to four times, and we are indeed seeing this today. Renewables, EVs, and heat pumps are picking up exponentially, as I've shown. It would be a great historical anomaly if such efficiency gains would not transfer into a rapid technology change. But the pace and the reach and the scale of this transition is up to us. History tells us that extraordinary transformations are possible and they happen faster than we think. But continued exponential growth in clean energy technologies isn't inevitable. And we need to drive similar exponential growth in heat pumps and hydrogen, in plant-based foods and restoration, reforestation, in biodiversity protection and other solutions. And we meet, need to make sure that they reach everyone everywhere. RMI's RMI co-founder, Amory Lovins, he always says you can't depress people to, into action. And he's absolutely right. All this, all this is possible but it is going to require constant problem solving and innovation in technology and supply chains, business models and policy and more. At RMI, we practice something called applied hope. It's not enough to be hopeful in a passive sense. 
We have to will into existence that world that we so desperately want and need. And, and when we do that together, we create a world worth being hopeful for in the first place. The energy transition is happening faster than you think. In Mokoloki Town, in Zhangjiakou, in Boston, in Mumbai, and probably pretty close to you as well. And when it all adds up, it's big and it's tipping markets. But we need more voices, yours and audience, audiences and the stakeholders you all reach talking about this exponential growth, acknowledging that it's really happening and amplify this louder positive narrative of possibility and opportunity. That it's late, it's, but it's not too late. But later is too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. We really appreciate that. And uh, I did put into the questions or the chat box that if you do have questions, please go ahead and send those in. Thank you to those who have sent them in. We're going to start off a couple of questions from Sarah first, and then I will get to some of our audience questions. So Sarah, go ahead. First of all, John, thank you so much uh, for an inspiring and enlightening presentation. I always enjoy listening to you speak because every time I learn many new things, uh, and today was not an exception. Um, I really uh, like what you have to say in terms of um, understanding the challenges, and I too have read recent reports that have confirmed that we have hit that 1.5 degree warming um, threshold, but uh, that we also, this, this exponential growth in markets um, is helping us reach those tipping points faster than expected. Um, so that's fantastic. You uh, talk a lot about the global south, and you talk about how, first of all, it's so imperative for them to leapfrog fossil fuels and the level of fossil fuel adoption in terms of their infrastructure that um, you know kind of the West um, has um, incorporated uh, in our history. Can you talk a little bit about who you see leading? growth in the global south and how that plays out? Is it Chile? Is it Brazil? What does that look like? Yeah, yeah. No, this, and this is super important. You know, there are 3.6 billion people, almost half the planet today, right, that don't have the energy they need or can't afford the energy that's available, right? Um, and so there's a massive energy thirst that exists out there. And if we meet all of that energy thirst through you know, kind of uh, uh, a fossil intensive development, we're literally all cooked, right? So we have to make sure that these technologies, uh, these solutions all are the, the, the first solution pathway for these 3.6 billion, not, you know, kind of the reserve uh, path after they, they trod through the well-worn path of fossil intensive development. Um, as far as leaders out there, there is, there are, there's a lot happening in many countries, but I, I think, you know, you look at the economic growth and the pace of growth right now, and you have to look to India as being one of, it is the fastest growing economy in the world right now. It is an economy that is rich in solar, that is also uh, greatly vulnerable to lethal heat, uh, as I mentioned. And so it's created a political focus and a market focus that is enabling the very rapid transition. Um, and so we're seeing all sorts of innovations there in uh, large scale solar development, in grid scale storage and, and kind of build the build out of large scale pumped hydro facilities, for instance, in innovations around battery supply chains, uh, specifically for EV uh, adoption. You know, when you look at the cost of a two-wheeler or three-wheeler operation in a city like Delhi, it's a quarter the cost today to operate an EV as it is to operate an internal combustion engine. Um, and so the economics are so strong that you've seen rapid, rapid development overall. And RMI has managed a, a partnership here with the Indian government um, on a program called Shunya, which means zero in Sanskrit, that's focused on how do we electrify vehicles faster and make sure that 
that you know kind of everybody benefits from these savings quicker. And already in two years of, of operation, the they've achieved uh, 500 million zero carbon deliveries uh, of people and packages throughout India and garnered about 200 corporations that are all working in concert to build out supply chains and, and you know, kind of uh, elevate solutions. So I, I do look at India as a place that has the internal capital, it has the entrepreneurial capacity, it has the great need, and it has the political motivation that it's starting to pace set there as well. Um, you know, the second fastest growing economy in the world is Indonesia uh, right now. And they are, you know, have been in the middle of discussions globally um, for the joint energy transition or the just energy transition partnership or JETP process. They're earlier stage than India, but are thinking very much about how they industrialize in a way that feeds into and builds kind of supply chains where Indonesia can compete at the same time that they solve their own problems uh, of, uh, of uh, green development um, and air pollution in the process. Uh, and so we're starting to see, you know, kind of they're a, they're a large miner of nickel. They're, they're starting to think about how exactly do they not just export uh, products, but build up the supply chain within within country there. There are others, you know, Brazil has its own set of capacities and, and opportunities that it's it's adding uh, uh, in. Um, so, but we are seeing more Global South-led solutions specifically for Global South countries kind of emerge uh, um, uh, and benefit from this transition in the process. Thanks, John. I have one more question and then I'm going to kick it back over to Mike because I know we have several audience questions. But um, as for my question, uh, we know that that elections have consequences and we have some major elections coming up in the US, in Europe, in India. And you did a masterful job of showing how market forces are driving demand for the adoption of uh, solar and wind and batteries and EVs and other advanced electrification technologies and even energy efficiency technologies like heat pumps. But clearly, if we're going to uh, be able to scale at the pace that we need to, um, we are also going to need um, friendly regulations and policies. And uh, so I know that um, that we all wish you had a crystal ball. I <laughs> could predict what would happen, but uh, can you talk a little bit about what you think the implications are of the upcoming elections and um, do they matter dramatically in terms of will they, if they go one way versus another way, will they impact uh, the rate and pace of change or do you feel like market forces are so strong that it almost doesn't really matter? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's an, at the nut of so many conversations I'm having these days, Sarah, on on the geopolitics of the transition. Um, you know, policies absolutely matter, right? Uh, there is no question. Uh, and when we think about you know kind of how to accelerate, it, economics are important and the technologies that make that possible. We need to have the market support, right? Um, so demand from the market that's pulling forward, and you need to organize that. We need to have policies that under that undergird and support those. We need to have finance supporting those. And those four things are kind of what we need to put in sync in order to move the transition at scale. Policy is a it is at a fragile moment here. Um, uh, and I think when we look at it, you know, roughly half the world's uh, population is going to vote this year. So it's an election super cycle. Um, uh, you know, and more of the on, you know, when we look globally, there are autocratic options on many ballots right now. And we see overall a, a likely push toward a more conservative view toward the energy transition. Um, that, that could, you know, without question, not just slow the energy transition, but also lead to additional support for the current incumbents within the energy economy that we have to be conscious of and aware of. You know, depending on what numbers you look at, 
somewhere between $1 trillion and $6 trillion today are used as subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, right? That's a massive, it's a giant, giant number, right, that, that we look at that we're, we're essentially putting our foot on the, the accelerator and the brake at the same time here, that we've got to rationalize and manage some of that. When we think about, you know, kind of election outputs, uh, that is very much at stake right now. Um, and it's playing out in different economies around the world. The good news is the more the economics showcase the jobs, they showcase the pollution reduction, they showcase the health benefits, they showcase, uh, in the end, um, some of the supply chain and technology dividends, the more this energy transition becomes a non-political issue, right? It becomes supported by everybody. And right now, the big, the danger and the frailty in this election is around so much mismessaging that exists out there um, uh, that is coloring the view of how this, this transition does indeed lead to much greater benefits distributed much more equitably around the world and therefore should be uh, outside the realm of politics. All right, John, I got a couple questions from the audience while we still have a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple questions because um, I also had this on my mind, but it came in from two different people as well. And it's basically centered around resources. Um, you know, what do we do to make the battery process more of a closed cycle? Because you, you, you'll have spent batteries at some point, but then also just acquiring the materials, the 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 natural resources to make these batteries, how is this going to work when you have this exponential growth um, for t a clean tech and batteries? Yeah, Mike, this is, uh, again, this is at the center of lots of conversations and at the center of geopolitics right now. Um, it It is the first thing, there are huge equity issues, right, around how we develop these new supply chains. I will say, there are huge equity issues around our old supply chains too. And when we look at the volume of materials, the, uh, the amount of material that we need to run a fossil economy versus a clean energy economy is about 300 times larger, right? Um, so, so think about shrinking the overall impacts of mining and uh, you know, logistics and transportation to a much smaller container here of impact. Now. That doesn't mean that, you know, kind of cobalt mining in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo or lithium mining, uh, you know, in Latin America isn't going to have significant impacts. And we need to learn from, uh, you know, kind of past experiences on how to equitably develop resources alongside the communities uh, to ensure that, that the dividend, not just the economic dividend, but the clean energy dividend uh, helps develop and grow local economies, and in the process also uh, uh, ensures a safe and more secure world for everybody, right? That, that is possible here, but it takes time. You know, we need to go, go slow to go fast here in building up that, that support. When we look at the numbers, we have plenty of all the materials that are required. That's not a, a constraint. Uh, markets have responded very quickly from lithium, nickel, cobalt, you know, innovation has taken many, has started to design many of the critical minerals out of the system as well, um, that are giving us uh, lots of hope that, that the market can solve this very quickly, but we have to focus on that equity element and make sure that we support, you know, kind of just and, and thoughtful co-development with uh, local partners every step along the way uh, to make sure we don't uh, create the same problems that we've, we've made historically around uh, resource consumption. The good news is, as you alluded to in your question, that this, the prospects here for closing the loop and instead of having a throughput economy, having a circular economy are incredibly great here because the, the materials are so valuable once you want to, once you take nickel or cobalt or lithium and put them into a battery, you want to reclaim them. And so the 
we have never been closer to actually snapping into focus a uh, circular economy because the economic incentives are aligned, the energy security and national concerns are aligned, that once you bring that, that, those materials into your economy, you can keep them there and circle, you know, kind of reuse them rather than being dependent upon other countries to, to provide them in the future. So that's important, all important dynamics and considerations uh, for us here going forward. One more question, if I could, before we have to uh, to wrap up. Um, Judy wanted to know, are there similar efforts to Home Builders Can for retrofits? Yeah, so that is a, a great question, Judy, and it's one that when we look at the retrofit community, it hasn't galvanized here in the same way in the United States that it has in, in Europe. And so that's an, an open area for uh, um, uh, exploration and development here, uh, especially linking, you know, kind of the, the, uh, um, the intensity of the carbon uh, materials used in those retrofits. We haven't, at RMI, haven't tackled the retrofit market yet, um, but it's something that uh, we'd be keen to exchange thoughts on and, and see if we can build momentum there for sure, because it is uh, uh, um, a significant portion of what needs to be done, especially here in the United States, uh, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, kind of the overall activities toward getting to a, a net zero building stock. All right, uh, we are gonna have to wrap it up there, uh, John, because they want me to keep this train on schedule. But uh, we, could, we could sit here and talk and, and have questions for probably another hour. So I want you to know that the audience was very much into your presentation. They really enjoyed it. They were very thankful for it. We are very thankful that you were able to join us today and share your insights. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Mike.